Hi, everybody. This is the KegelCast from Kegel.com. We're all about political cartoons and cartoonists and about the news and issues of the day. Be sure to subscribe wherever you're watching this or listening to this and visit KegelCast.com to see all of the cartoons and podcasts in case you're just getting an audio podcast and you want to see what we're talking about. We'll discuss the top 10 most reprinted editorial cartoons in America from the last week. I'm Daryl Cagle, and I'm here with my editor, Brian Farrington, our Cagle Cartoons newspaper syndicate editor. And today we have Cagle cartoonist Dave Womond, and we have Jeff Katurba. So both these guys are our most reprinted cartoonists at Cagle Cartoons. They are always in the top 10. They often have multiple cartoons in the top 10. This week, both Jeff and Dave have two cartoons in the top 10. And that is just so impressive. And it's so important for us because we've got to have a product that editors like, and it's the popular cartoons with editors that let the cartoonists draw what they want to draw that's unpopular with editors. I should say what's popular with editors is not necessarily the best cartoons. It's not necessarily what Dave and Jeff are going to think are their best cartoons. It's the cartoons that the editors like, and editors have a different criteria for what they like than what cartoonists like. We like to be hard hitting and force our opinions on others and say things that can be controversial and try to convince readers of our point of view. And editors like things that are light and funny and don't generate letters to the editor. I should say that both you guys do both. Uh, And I really appreciate that because if we didn't have the cartoons the editors like, we'd have nothing to sell. And it lets you do everything when we have a mix of things. And, uh, One of these days, I'm going to start doing podcasts about cartoons editors don't like that we like, and then I'll ask you to show us some of those cartoons. So I I want to let everybody know that these are just the cartoons that are printed more than anybody else and that our customers, the editors, like more than anybody else. But they may not be the cartoons that Jeff and Dave like the most. So any comments on that, gentlemen? Go ahead. Hey, Jeff. Well, yeah, I'll, yeah, yeah, I'll jump in. Yeah, well, I mean that, that's true, and but I appreciate this in Dave's work, and and it's certainly something that it's something that's been one of my goals, I guess, when drawing cartoons is to mix it up. And when I was at the newspaper, that was something that I always did. It was uh, a thing that I noticed in early on in Jim Borgman's work. Jim Borgman, the cartoonist who has continued to draw the comic strip since, but when he was drawing editorial cartoons in Cincinnati, I noticed that in his work, and that one day he might hit you really hard. Uh, with a really strongly opinionated cartoon. And the next day, something light and fluffy about life in Cincinnati. And I just, I found that to be a a great technique uh, in in an authentic way as someone who is drawing regularly in a local newspaper. And and I I feel like that that continues now. And I think that it's something that readers, readers get tired if they're continually pummeled with hard hitting and predictable cartoons. And I think it's interesting. A lot of composers did that. Beethoven, for example, would come out with something really experimental and the audience was like offended by it. And then the next time he'd come back with something more traditional and happy to be like, okay, okay, we're, we're good with Beethoven. And I kind of feel like I've kind of just authentically, organically done that in my career. And I find that that just engages readers more and doesn't wear them as much. That, that's just kind of my take on it. Yeah, Dave, you've got the number I, one cartoon this week. I'm going to show you your cartoon here. Sure. And I, I agree with Jeff just as far as um, the hard hitting cartoons are much more fun to draw. Um, but, you know, it is good to shake it up and have like just a, a light chuckle. And I notice online, like on Twitter, the hard hitting cartoons get all the likes. And then someone will post one of my, like a cartoon closer to what's on the screen now. And that will get maybe a few likes, but it's popular with the paper. So, you know, I don't blame yeah, the, the people on the yeah. are very different audience yeah. than the newspaper <laughs> editors. And I also suspect that the newspaper readers are a different audience than the newspaper mm-hmm. editors and that they might like more <clears throat> hard hitting partisan cartoons, but mm-hmm. uh, that's not where newspapers are going. So your cartoon is a Valentine's <clears throat> Day cartoon. We call these pox on both your houses cartoons where we're bashing Republicans <laughs> and Democrats equally. And that's something editors like. That bashing them both equally is just as good for editors as having neither of them appear at all. (laughs) So you've got Cupid and you've got the Democrat donkey and the Republican elephant. Donkey says, hey, are you carrying a Cupid arrow without a permit? And uh, Cupid says, oh, I'm just trying to get you guys to like each other. And the elephant says, is that pointy thing like a vaccine needle? I refuse to get the shot. 
I think that's funny. Yeah, that works well. <laughs> People, people aren't going to complain about that, and it's funny. And, you know, I think you're going to notice as we go through all of these cartoons how important holidays are to editors. We're going to show you the top 10 cartoons. This is number one of the last week. And then we're also going to go into the top 10 cartoons that you guys have had in your entire editorial cartooning career with us over the years. And this, I think, is borne out even more when you look at it on that kind of a grand scale of how much emphasis editors have on holidays and on uh, nothing from the left and the right. Yeah, um, that's their number one Dave, request a... every season. Uh, they ask, uh, are you guys going to have Memorial Day cartoons? Are you going to have Fourth of July cartoons? And they ask those way in advance. So they're very important to mm -hmm. editors because they like to cover those things because readers like them. I was just going to say, I put this one out about uh, almost a week ahead of Valentine's Day because I thought I'm going to end up forgetting. So that way it gives them papers a lot of time to. Uh, put it in if they want ahead of time or whatever. Something yeah. like, exactly like Memorial Day, of course, it's, you know, it's on a Monday and, and editors are planning the weekend. And I know how it was when I was with the newspaper, you're already thinking on Tuesday and Wednesday for the next weekend and ahead and it, there's a holiday. I was wondering for you when you drew this or after the fact, uh, when those other objects were shot down, were you thinking, ah, if I just waited and not drawn Cupid then, maybe I could have drawn Cupid in some other capacity, but I don't already done that. I don't know if that occurred to you. And that sometimes happens to yeah. me where I'm, I'm like, I don't want to do things too soon because maybe something else will happen. But yeah, no, it's funny because uh, the, the next cartoon that was in the top 10 is, has the, um, I don't want to jump ahead too much, but was had some of the things that were shot down during the week. And I thought Cupid would have been put on there, but I thought I already did the Cupid cartoon. And then it ended up a whole bunch of other cartoonists did a Cupid being shot. down. There's Chris Wyant. Chris is a a uh, New Yorker cartoonist, he draws two cartoons a week for us. One of them is for the Boston Globe. And he's got a couple guys sitting in the bar with all the Super Bowl stuff on the wall. And, and they've got their drinks in front of them. The bartender says, who do you want in the Super Bowl, red state or blue state? I get it. It's, uh, you know, the football, it's <laughs> Super Bowl time. Here's Dave Granlund with a Valentine's Day cartoon. Dozen roses, choices for your Valentine this year. If money is no object is also a dozen eggs. And that's cute. You know, the High Price of Eggs cartoons has been exciting for everybody. It's very yeah. exciting. I'm working on one of those right now, actually. <laughs> I mean, I gave, at this very moment. <laughs> I gave my wife a dozen eggs. I thought I'd get her something expensive this year. This didn't go over so well as the, as the Rosies. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's Jeff's cartoon. I think we're at number four. And Cupid says, I'm not buying it. And he's shooting at the Happy Valentine's Day balloon Chinese surveillance balloon over the earth cupid at fifty thousand feet that's cute yeah or another <laughs> object or another object so I, I i drew this over the weekend when we found out that these other objects were being shot down and uh you know one of the frustrations with deadlines is that no editors in general unless there's some huge breaking story are going to be working on the weekend to drop in a cartoon uh you know that's that's one of the things that's changed when i was at the newspaper if there was a big breaking story it was possible that i could go would go in on a saturday or sunday and drop something in last minute but that's not really going to happen now and so those those objects were being shot down and i knew that probably other people would come up with this idea but i wanted to draw it first and at least at least get it out into the world uh and then post it first thing in the morning for editors to pick up looking mm -hmm. good i didn't know you had to go into the newspaper to draw your cartoon the Back in the days. days. Oh, Back yeah, day. certainly. I mean, I, I, well, yeah, I mean, it was, there was a time when I was working uh, seven days a week. And even today in Omaha, we've had a, a, a snowstorm and everything's closed down. And there was a time, when I think back to traditional newspaper land, there was a time when if there was a snowstorm, I would, if it was on the weekend, I would still trudge in to draw a cartoon about the snowstorm. And that's one of those cartoons that I was referring to earlier where you know, you're, you're drawing cartoons, criticizing the mayor and the governor and whatever, but then what is that one cartoon we can all kind of get behind and agree on and say, okay, maybe Jeff's not such a bad guy after all. And he's one of us, he's dealing with, you know, the schools being closed or whatever and getting it in as quickly as possible for the next morning. <laughs> all right, gentlemen, here's the next one. Dave, this is your cartoon. It's got a, a jet pilot and he's got his uh, little graphic kills next to his window on the side of the plane, a balloon, Mary Poppins, Peter Pan, E.T. and Snoopy. 
this is a very funny cartoon. And also, you know, where we put the copyright acknowledgement in the corner, you've got apologies <laughs> to Nuts, Peter Pan, Mary Poppins, and E.T., <laughs> which is in itself a very funny copyright acknowledgement. I should say that's kind of a, a legal advice requirement for editorial cartoons who are have the legal permission in the United States through the courts to be able to use copyright and trademark characters that other people own. But we have kind of rules that we need to follow. And, and one of them that we follow is putting an acknowledgement of the copyright holder in the corner. And sometimes those acknowledgements like this would look pretty funny. So uh, I enjoyed this cartoon. It's got to be a record. Dave, that has to be a record yeah. for <laughs> yeah. acknowledgements. I know. I, I was like, I was thinking, geez, I, I would have zoomed in a bit more, but I needed room to put in the apology. So. <laughs> <laughs> it is a and very I, funny cartoon. Everyone was upset about the uh, Snoopy, like they're, like not the sop with camel, not the flying ace. How could you do that to Snoopy? I thought, okay, no one else, no one cares about Peter Pan or ET or Mary Poppins. You know, I noticed I noticed that on TV, uh, they're always murdering people on TV, but they can't murder a puppy. That would make the no, public no. outraged. Yeah. I, I well, I'm offended that you that. Uh, put a red balloon on there. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know. <laughs> I didn't I, say apologies for the balloon, so I forgot that one. So, I mean, I, there's a wonderful old, well, yeah, there's a wonderful old French film, uh, The Red Balloon. I uh, won an Academy Award, I think, in 1956 for a short film. It's lovely. It's actually one of the reasons I, I uh, fell in love with uh, cartooning. I fell in love with French culture because of that film and thus found French cartoonists when I was uh, like five years old. And then, uh, that, that's what kind of launched my career, so to speak. Did you have any other uh, icons that you considered putting on the side of the plane for kills at all? Were there any other candidates? I did think of Cupid, but then I thought uh, this one, <laughs> this one, yeah, this might go past uh, Valentine's Day, so I thought I'll just uh, I'll leave it at with these five, I guess. So, you know, it's true. If Cupid was in there, they wouldn't print it past Valentine's mm -hmm. Day. Yeah, you could have put Santa Claus in there. Could have. Yep, Superman. You know. There's, you could have had a whole bunch, you know. Yeah, there's there's a lot, a lot of room for. All right, this one is by Canadian cartoonist Guy Parsons. He's got a guy uh, looking at his computer, and he says, he thinks finally. And looking at the computer, it says, "Want to stop getting phishing emails? Click here." Uh, that's cute. You know, I might mention we've got two Canadian cartoonists who masquerade as American cartoonists. One of them is you, Dave. Oh, and you know, uh, you know if we. Uh, if we put you in the section show, it said you were Canadian cartoonist, you would be absolutely invisible to American editors. Uh, that's what makes you disappear. But uh, you guys are great American cartoonists, and we're delighted to have you here. Oh, thanks. I'm, I actually went to school, uh, art college with Guy, so we've, uh, we go back a long way. Really? You were in the same yeah. class in college? Yeah. yeah. He well, very good. I like guys. He taught me everything I know. So. I like Guy's <laughs> choice of, uh, of purple hair here. I think that's like, uh, I don't know why that, like, that's something that wouldn't occur to me. I, I tend to stick with a traditional palette and I love, I love pushing the limit just even graphically. It's, it makes it, it makes it more interesting. <laughs> it is fun. Now, this is the cartoon, uh, that the cartoonists are talking about because it is largely drawn by artificial intelligence. It's the first editorial cartoon to be. A syndicated editorial cartoon, I think, to be drawn by artificial intelligence is by Rick McKee. And it's got the Pandora's box monster coming out of the artificial intelligence box. Good, nasty looking monster. And the guy is uh, back turned to it thinking, who the heck is Pandora? Looking at the packing slip on the box. I think that's cute. We actually did a podcast with Rick about his creating this cartoon and about the other AI stuff that he's been doing. And we're going to run that podcast after uh, this episode. So be sure to stay tuned for our next podcast, probably on Monday. What, uh, what, what's your take on this, you guys, on uh, how you, I, what you think I love of it. what Rick did and then what do you think of the future of AI? And I love the concept that uh, <clears throat> using actual AI to create the image. I thought that was a great idea. And as far as AI, it's just yet another thing coming that we'll, we artists are going to have to adjust to and figure out to, uh, how to deal with it, I guess, you know, it's, uh, it's in its infancy stage, but, um, uh, like we, I, I always thought this is a pretty safe profession. No, a uh, computer can't re recreate what we do, but those days are uh, coming to an end now. So I have a, I have a friend who's a, a TV commentator and he wrote a commentary against the use of AI and he used AI to write 
an opinion against the use of AI and it was brilliant. And he didn't, I don't think he, I don't think he told his audience and it made all these great points why AI is awful. (laughs) That's like this meta scary thing. I, I, you know, like Dave said, I mean, it's a tool and, you know, we'll see where it goes and I don't want to be all panic stricken, but I had uh, uh, Everett's class and I was taking on uh, commissions uh, for Christmas uh, last fall at about the same time that AI was got kind of blowing up and it was really depressing. I'm like, hey, send me your photos. I'll draw your caricature. And then there are all these brilliant, wonderful caricatures filling up on Instagram and Facebook. And I just thought, oh, man, uh, I, I guess the one thing I, I want to believe is that uh, it can replicate intelligence and and beautiful art. But there is something about humanity and i know that ai is being programmed for that but i want to believe that that there's something about humanity and kindness and human experience that can't be replicated but that's probably already out the door too i don't i don't know well you know there's there are styles that ai there are styles that ai does better than other styles Mm -hmm. and those i think are the artists that are most threatened in the beginning the styles like when i was back at in college at art center in the 70s the the Mark English, Bernie Fuchs, Bob Peake kind of styles that, oh gosh, AI does those yeah. great. Yeah. When I was working for the Muppets in the eighties, I worked with all these, uh, airbrush artists and lettering artists, you know, the guys that do the Muppet logo and the, the lettering on the book covers, those guys are all gone. Nobody mm-hmm. does that anymore because everybody does it on a computer. Uh, mm-hmm. professions disappear, you know, 120 years ago, there were 150,000 full-time working illustrators in America. And then uh, all of the catalogs started using photographies and, uh, you know, three-fourths of them are out of work in a couple of years. Um, This stuff really does replace people. And these elements of thinking how superior it is to have them done by real people have in the past not carried the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think ultimately, I think the illustrator, I don't know about the editorial cartoonist and the comic strip and things like that initially, but I think the just the freelance illustrator is, is in real trouble because these things, I, I already see things on social media about art directors saying, oh, this is a wonderful tool and I can do this and I, that. And, and I think it will totally eliminate uh, the freelance illustrator. Um, and I don't think the public's going to care. I think the public's going to think this is a wonderful new tool. And, mm-hmm. and, and I don't really think they realize the, the domino effect. I think even publishers are thinking, well, maybe we won't hire a children's book author because we could we can do it. We can write it ourselves and we can illustrate it in-house, but, but everybody's going to have that magic genie. So how is that going to affect publishers when everybody can do the same thing on their computer? They don't even need a publisher anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then how will that affect the market when, you know, in terms of, cause you can't copyright anything in an AI. So, um, that'll be interesting. So I, I, I think the domino effect here is, is, uh, going to be bad and I don't know where it's going to end up, but there, there is something to be said for having an original piece of art. And so I could just see people saying, Hey, this, this one was created by an actual human. You know, it's almost the reverse of the, I am not a robot box. <laughs> right, right. Well, have to check. You, should, you should see the unsolicited submissions we get. We get submissions from guys who are so proud of their memes on the internet, where they're stealing art and photography somewhere and just mm. putting their words on top of it. And they want us to syndicate that. Right. Well, the generations that are younger than us, uh, pr- presumably millennial and Gen Z, they don't have any perception of that. Uh, they, they, mm-hmm. they they just take things and they share and they have, you know, memes aren't, aren't monetized in any way. Uh, they just share them. And I mean, it's a shame whoever started memes didn't do that, but they, they didn't, they never did. And they just, they just randomly create things and uh, there's no market there because it's flooded and it's anonymous. And I think that's what AI will continue to do. And mm-hmm. unless there's legislation and um, things to protect creators, but I, I just, I think this, uh, the Pandora, box is a perfect metaphor for that because i think you have no idea so what do we do when someone submits lovely ai generated drawings that they have written uh stuff to go with and their writing is fine and they're expressing their own opinions and all the drawing is done by ai is that something we would consider i don't know what would you guys do it's uh, it's something we'll have to debate i'm sure it's coming down the pike for sure Mm -hmm. and how to tell the difference too like how do you know if it's ai created or or right I mean, that's the thing about well, yeah. Rick played around with this. He showed us several examples and he, he had several, uh, uh, iterations of this and he, and he kept playing around with the, uh, the text prompts, the comma delineated sentences that you have to do to 
to get this art. And it, this came out pretty close to a, a brushy kind of traditional editorial cartoon comic strip style. And he just manipulated the background, blended it in. And, and that's why it looks convincing. If you, if he hadn't told you it was done by AI, you'd think, oh, Rick's art's really improved, uh, uh, in detail, but you know, in, in terms of, uh, you know, Rick's a great cartoonist. I don't mean to disparage him, but I mean, in terms of how much time he spent on that, you, cause we all mm -hmm. do that when we see somebody and they may have spent a couple extra hours on something like, oh, wow, that's a great cartoon. He really spent a lot of time drawing whatever it is. Um, and it could have passed. No one would have questioned, oh, Rick didn't draw that. They would have said, oh, he really spent some extra time on it because it, mm -hmm. it's passable. Uh, and it's it, literally, he said it took him two minutes to, to create this. Seriously. Of, wow. Uh, of, uh, the main art and then he just drew his man on the street on the corner there but, of course you know, the box is drawn by ai also yeah the box everything mm -hmm. except the man in the corner yeah and and they, he put the ai Dar on it that's what he put on it Dar daryl i have a confession to make uh everything i've submitted to kegel cartoons in the last five months it's all <laughs> ai oh the world has already ended <laughs> i thought it was going to end bloody <laughs> hell all right Finally, moving on. This one's by Dave Granlund, who is, uh, you know, he's right up there with you guys as being the most popular ones. And he's got Mitt Romney standing in front of the Capitol holding a newspaper that says Mitt and Santos doesn't belong in Washington. GOP pushback and Mitt thinks, I'm for truth, family values, and following my conscience. Maybe I'm the one who doesn't belong here. Good old Mitt. All right. This one's by Kevin Sires, our cartoonist from uh, North Carolina, who's now our cartoonist from Maryland. And we've got a, it looks like an air-to-air -air missile coming at Winnie the Pooh's balloon that's got him up in the air. And uh, Winnie the Pooh says, oh, bother. And it says, news item, Norad adjusts its radar, spots more airspace incursions. That's cute. He's got his apologies to Disney in there. Hey, hey, I wonder what's going to happen with AI when uh, they copy a Disney artist. They're going to have like a whole flock of lawyers going after whoever did that so well i think that's where it's going to be decided in terms of yeah. uh uh you know what's going to happen in court and, and because the uh the copyright and trademark laws don't even address it really they say that mm -hmm. if you created an ai it's not protected so you can't you can't monetize it in that sense but but disney's fanatical especially since they took mm -hmm. over star wars you know they don't allow anybody to use their star wars imagery i mean george lucas used to allow fan art and things like that but disney's really cracking down on that and uh especially now bob Iger's back and they're desperate to bring up their billion dollar profits again but um i should add here that we yeah. are artists and not lawyers and we don't know what the hell we're talking we don't about. right know. exactly yeah. so <laughs> <laughs> right all right and this is the cartoon number 10 this one is by our dear jeff katurba it's got uh the statue of liberty and on her base it says give me your tired your poor your huddled masses yearning to breathe free and then in the next frame lady liberty is gone and there's a, a derelict looking Uncle Sam asleep leaning up against the base, which now says, give me your tired of shootings, your huddled masses yearning for safety. He's asleep because he is not paying attention to the problem at hand. And that's sad. You know, this, this kind of brings up an issue that editorial cartoonists waver on, which is act exactly who is Uncle Sam. Yeah. For most American car editorial cartoons, Uncle Sam is every man. He is not the government. He is every man. And every man is mm -hmm. concerned about the shootings. It's the government that doesn't care about the shootings. And you find internationally when they draw Uncle Sam, they're drawing Uncle Sam to represent the government rather than the American citizen. And I wonder if you grapple with that, uh, Jeff. That's one thing that makes yeah. American editorial cartoons uh, incomprehensible overseas is uh, Uncle Sam uh, never quite fits an exact pattern for them to understand. <laughs> Yeah, well, Uncle Sam to me is a shapeshifter. So I still think of Uncle Sam in the traditional way uh, that that Uncle Sam represents the U.S. government more than more than the average person. That's the average Joe. That's how I think of. If I'm going to draw the average Joe, I'm going to draw the average Joe or Jane or whatever. Also, having said that, though, I've also uh, grappled with Uncle depicting Uncle Sam as an old white guy and. That is not who we are, and I don't think it, it expresses diversity. So over time, I have, uh, in the past, drawn Uncle Sam as Uncle as Aunt Jane. Uh, I have drawn uh, an Uncle Sam or Aunt Jane figure of color, and I have uh, found that uh, readers don't sometimes understand what I'm doing there, and it's a little frustrating. They expect mm -hmm. the cliche imagery 
And frankly, as a cartoonist, I wouldn't mind killing Uncle Sam as a symbol altogether, honestly. And it, the same with the elephants and donkeys. And I draw those yeah, exactly. as much as anyone else. But it's, it's, it's kind of a tired thing. And yet it's a shorthand because we're only allowed so much time and space in that panel. And we have to get to the point as quickly as we can. And it's, mm -hmm. it's difficult to uh, make a point quickly and it's, it's shorthand. So when you draw Uncle Sam, when I draw Uncle Sam, I mostly think of Uncle Sam as the, as the government. And it's a shorthand. I don't know what else we draw to, mm -hmm. to represent the government. So. Yeah. I don't. I don't think I've ever drawn him representing the government. It's always been every man. I put an Uncle Sam hat on a dog, and the dog is every man. You could always. I, go what, what, are, how, what do you think of Uncle Sam from uh, Canada? Yeah, no, it's just he's sort of the iconic. I think every, that's why we use him as everybody connects. I I think of him as every man, or you know, if you put him in the posters like the old uh, "We Want You," then you can you connect it more to the government, but. Uh, you can always go with an eagle, um, Statue of Liberty, you know, they're all sort of the same types of uh, cliches, but like I, it, uh, Jeff said, it gets the message across right away. You don't have to explain who this person is, who's like, why they're there. It's like, as soon as you see Uncle Sam or an eagle or Statue of Liberty, you know, right away it depicts America or the average Americans. The difference typically with the international cartoonists that we represent, uh, the international cartoonists for them, he's always the government. He's mm -hmm. never and every man. Yeah. Uh, one, and that's one interesting how Uncle thing, Sam was born. Mm -hmm. One interesting thing to look at is uh, cartoons from our uh, Chinese cartoonist Luoji, who draws uh, pretty strong anti-American propaganda cartoons uh, for his government-run newspaper. And anti -Hong uh, for Hong him, anti-Taiwan, yeah. Uncle Sam is is quite the monster in Luo Ji's cartoons, but he's the government monster. The people of America suffer at the hands of Uncle Sam. Well, this begs the question, what would AI come up with or what will AI come up with for a symbol of the American government? I mean, I'm as uh, concerned about AI as, as you guys, but, or, you know, but as uh, most people or some artists, but I'm also intrigued by what, where does this take us? Maybe, maybe it shakes things up a little bit just to be, just to be a little disruptive here. Maybe I wonder what AI would say, come up with a cartoon image of the American government or of the average person, not even the average man. I get tired of that, that as well, because it's the average person, you know, Jeff, this is your most popular cartoon you've ever drawn in your many years with us. And, uh, this is the gal driving the car and she's looking in the rear view mirror where there's a huge COVID and she says, please stay in the rear view mirror, please stay in <laughs> as she's driving towards a year three of COVID. Um, I can see why they like this. Well, with a mask hanging from the rearview mirror, I mean, we're, you know, mm -hmm. always seeing people with their masks hanging from the mirror. So that was a way for me to capture sort of that everyday experience that we all have. If we're not doing that ourselves, we've seen other cars with the mirror, you know, with the, yeah. the mask hanging from the mirror. So they I just wanted to give that kind of a, Sorry, I just, yeah, I just wanted to replace it. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. I want to give that sense of an everyday experience. And, uh, when I, I first conceived of this idea, I thought, oh man. I could see it, but I thought this is going to be a real challenge because there are a lot of elements going on here. We have the person, we have what she's saying, the mirror, the mask, the sign in the distance. And uh, this, this was a difficult one for me to, to pull off. Uh, and I, you know, but I, I'm, I'm happy with how it turned out, but it was a complex idea to squeeze into one image. Did you use a Ford tourist for the uh, dashboard or what did you? <laughs> Does that look like it might be? I don't, I, I can't remember. Uh, it might have been my own car, I don't recall. This was crazy. Uh, I, do that. Was this is, I can see the, the as main, many papers as Ken printed, printed it. I can see the main challenge in, in trying to lay this out is the rear view mirror, because you know, how, how big can you go with it being believable? Mm -hmm. At the same time, that's the main thing you have to put in the rear view mirror. So it works. You, you pulled it off wonderfully. Well, thanks. And here's a cartoon that wouldn't have been done. And they, I know you can attest to this too. Like, you know, early on in COVID, I didn't even want to draw the dang thing because it just, mm -hmm. it was disgusting to even think about. And then after time, it was this, you know, serious thing. And after time, we started allowing ourselves to have some fun with it and kind of joke around about what it looked like. I mean, does that really look like COVID -y thing? I, I guess, but we, it sort of became the symbol. We we're talking about symbols, Uncle Sam and elephants and donkeys, and that will yeah. now forever be the symbol for COVID. Mm -hmm. Green ball with red spikes. Yeah. It's very, it's very Christmassy, you know, very and, and just that little bit of it, 
you you know exactly what it is just right. seeing it in the mirror. So right. I thought you did a nice yeah. job as far like you could be tempted to show the entire thing, but what you the solution you chose works works great. So thanks. Yeah. And if you so if you see me the woman's pupil, you can see her the reflection of the COVID in her eyeball from the reading <laughs> mirror. Just very detailed. So here is your second most popular cartoon, Jeff. You've got the two astronauts poking their head out of a space station. When, and they see three shooting stars. One says, looks like we have company. The other one says, UFO. First one again says, no, just Bezos, Musk, and Branson showing off. That's what they want. Bezos, Musk, and Branson are cartoon characters. Yeah, that works well. Talk about they a little bit about one. your process, Jeff. I mean, are you, you're all digital now, right? Yep. I was a long time old school guy, uh, preferred to draw a uh, pen and ink paper. I love getting ink and paint on my hands and my clothes, ruining neckties for many years. And then it was because of the pandemic that I began drawing digitally. I'd have, I was still working in the newspaper. I was avoiding going in. I was drawing, working remotely, but I had all of them year. I was scanning, I was printing and painting the scans and it was very complicated. That was all the newspaper. And my son reminded me that dad, you have this iPad sitting in a box four years, dig it out. And I, I just refused to, uh, and I talked to Steve Sack, the wonderful, yeah. amazing editorial cartoonist who's, who's uh, retired now, but, and he encouraged me to, to dive in. He said, Jeff, just one day decide you are going to now start drawing with, you know, digitally. And I, that's pretty much what I did. And it was, it was life-changing and yeah, that's, yeah, I'm not drawing that way. So uh, it looks good. Very good. So Thanks. mom and daughter are walking down the street, walking by the stores. And she says, what if the supply chain disrupts holiday deliveries? This was when we were having some supply chain problems. And boy, they liked this. They wanted cartoons about supply chain problems. Yeah, it's a good idea, I think. Like, Jeff always has ideas where I think, geez, I wish I thought of that. So that's like a, oh, good, a good cartoonist compliment. <laughs> when, when other cartoonists say, geez, I wish I that's, yeah, thanks. When they're walking by, I can't remember if you mentioned this, they're walking oops. by a, a dozen shops that talk about buying local, but they're saying, what about disrupting the, the deliveries? Mm -hmm. Yeah, pointing out the, the ironic irony. And that was something I tried to do locally is, you know, really, really support local as much as I could during the pandemic. I mean, I do anyway, but. Very good. All right. Here, Jeff, you've got uh, a big interest rates wrecking ball coming towards the housing market home of an innocent uh, homeowner. And the Fed is swinging the ball, and that's very scary and threatening. And editors love this one. Yeah, I wasn't happy with this drawing, Daryl. I felt that uh, the swing of the ball wasn't going to quite land. It might skim the top of the roof and not really crash in. I wish I had drawn this differently with more impact, a larger, much larger ball. Uh, and my friend, who is the TV commentator, is also a real, realtor, and I don't think he was very happy with this cartoon. Realtors didn't like this cartoon. Editors must have been getting angry letters from realtors. Okay, this one was wildly popular. Because uh, the story the editors want to cover is the nursing shortage. You've got a hiring sign above the emergency room sign that says, nurses needed and all of the ambulances are lined up because not enough nurses for them. Uh, a hiring a emergency. Nice yeah. Oh, hiring emergency. Yes. I, I looked at it as hiring nurses needed. It's the hiring emergency. Here you've got a mom and son sitting at their laptops. Son is writing, Dear Santa, and mom is writing, Dear Senator. That's cute. Her laptop says COVID-19 relief, still no deal. She is frustrated and she's stuck at home. And that's how we were all feeling. Just what the newspapers wanted. At that time, I should say, though, for every cartoon like this, there were probably eight cartoons bashing Donald Trump. And um, I think you'll notice among all of these cartoons, there's no cartoons about Donald Trump. And consistently during the last three years of the Trump administration, editors were simply not printing cartoons about Donald Trump. Drawing a Donald Trump cartoon was a guarantee that no one was going to see your cartoon. And that's, uh, that's very frustrating for cartoonists. And Trump is, is a cartoonist not? dream, you know? So it's like, <laughs> it's like a guy like that comes along, you, you got to draw him, you got to. There's so much more material. It is. And cartoonists, they developed their shorthand for him. He had the huge long tie that we did lots of mm -hmm. jokes with. He became really obese. Everybody had their own way of drawing his hair. 
Uh, some made him more orange than others, but he was consistently well, orange. Well, about uh, three months into his presidency, uh, we started to get a lot of blowback from editors that were, you know, why are you always bashing Trump? All your cartoonists bash Trump. We're going to go to another syndicate. And then they'd go to another syndicate, and a couple months later, they'd come back and said, they're even worse. I had to tell them, listen, you know that he's he's a unique creature, a uh, political creature. He's the gift that keeps on giving. And the cartoonists are commenting because the media is covering him 24-7. But to Daryl's point, I mean, editors just got tired of it because they didn't want the blowback from their readers and, and they, mm -hmm. they really wanted cartoons that were not Trump. So anything not Trump. And that's why we put up the, uh, the Trump friendly section on our, on our login page. So we had cartoons mm -hmm. on there that weren't bashing Trump because editors were praying for those and begging those for us. So we were all glad to see Trump go for a variety of reasons. So we didn't have to <laughs> let, let, deal with this anymore. He's still around, though. Yes, you know? he's still around. <laughs> I bet through this next campaign, we're still not going to see him in cartoons, though, in the newspapers. Yeah. The cartoonists will draw him, which it's is just, continuing it's, it's frustration. Thera it's therapeutic. You, you just need to get it out of your system. So even if no one prints it, you know, you still have fun doing it. So We had a cartoonist on Kegel.com who would draw nothing but obscene Trumps in obscene positions. And I had to talk to him. Editorial cartoons are uh, part of middle school curriculum. They're on... The AP history tests in eighth and 12th grade. We can't draw obscene Trump in these positions <laughs> every week. We can't do all the bodily fluids. You know, putting a bodily fluid in a cartoon means it never gets into a newspaper. You can't just draw bodily fluids. And uh, he said, you're censoring me. You're a Trump guy. America has gone mad. I get that all the time. Here's the censorship. But I rarely censor anything. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Jeff, you've got Santa's workshop. It's a Christmas cartoon. Sign in the window says elves wanted. Mrs. Santa says, This labor shortage is worse than we thought. And Santa says, Maybe we'll have to send gift cards because the workshop is empty. We've got a labor shortage. That's very sad. You know, what's sad is that I, I drew this, what, I guess, a couple of Christmases ago, and I drew this and I misread it. And I said, Why did I write Elvis wanted? <laughs> <laughs> Elvis wanted. All right, here's Grandpa talking to Granddaughter, and the computer says Watergate scandal fifty years later, and Grandpa says, "Let's just say I'm glad we didn't have social media back then." That's cute. You know, the newspapers are for Grandpa now, and everybody remembers Watergate scandal, and they talk to their grandkids. You have maybe my first Nick mind. Nixon cartoon in print. Well, actually, it isn't, but. You know, I'm still, hey, they're finally getting around running my Nixon cartoons, at least that. <laughs> they won't run Trump, but. All right. This one is U.S. Postal Service slows delivery. The little boy is bringing his box of Halloween stuff, but mom is doing the Christmas cards. And mom says, yes, I can help decorate. But first, I must get these Christmas cards in the mail. I've noticed that um, after Halloween, newspapers love the, it's so early to be talking about Christmas cartoons and uh, the mixing together Christmas and thanksgiving and halloween this is what they love very good jeff it gives me an idea gives me an idea or maybe i'll easter coming maybe i'll work in christmas too so <laughs> all right here's your number 10 cartoon another big one back to school sale at the store uh little daughter is uh, carrying her heavy backpack but mom is carrying the huge backpack with crushing weight labeled inflation and boy the newspapers love the inflation cartoons the big Heavy, fat inflation cartoons. Very good, Jeff. They're fun to draw. They're fun to draw. Heavy weighted things are fun to draw. I don't know <laughs> if you feel that way, Dave, but oh, absolutely. there's just something about that. Yeah, the physicality of it, you know? You see, it always makes a nice, strong graphic image, too, like a nice vignette to play with um, when you have that yep. sort of imagery. Yeah. Heavy, heavy is, is fun to draw, big and small. Okay, Dave, this is your most popular cartoon ever. And it's a time change cartoon, and it's a New Year's cartoon, and that's crossing two editor favorites. And also, it's uh, complaining about how bad things are cartoon, which is another thing that editors love. You've combined them all here to make this fantastic popular cartoon. So the couple is sitting at the breakfast table. Uh, husband is reading the newspaper that says, Daylight Savings has got Trump and Pelosi on the front of it. And... The lady says, don't forget, we gain an hour this weekend. And the man says, does anyone really want an extra hour of 2020? This just hits every button, Dave. Yeah, yeah, that's a kill exactly. multiple birds with one stone in that cartoon. 
that's funny because I, I thought this was kind of a weak cartoon, so I almost didn't do it. And here it's the top selling one. So, you know, I still don't know what I'm doing after all these years. So. <laughs> I think every year I can oh. just put in 21 and then 22. You just can't reuse it to this a, one. Every yes. Taste yeah. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Jeff McNally, the wonderful, amazing, brilliant editorial cartoonist, uh, had a tax related cartoon mm -hmm. uh, of someone filling out a tax form. And every year, he copy would, of the ten forty with the new, yeah, yeah with the yeah. new, the new, a different year on it. Yeah. So here you've got uh, the changing of the lattes uh, in front of the Starbucks. The big eggnog latte is changing with the pumpkin spice latte, like they do uh, in England at the Queen's house. And this is just so cute. Pumpkin la spice latte, pumpkin spice in cartoons is just crazy popular with editors if you see any kind of reference to pumpkin spice in a cartoon that just makes it really please the editors i think one of uh, Rick unless you uh, put top top cartoons was the pumpkin spice cartoon so yeah oh right unless you combine trump with pumpkin spice and then <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah yeah so this this one was i was just gonna say that one was fun to draw i, I uh, came up with the idea of putting the little swizzle sticks at the end so right. i thought that that kind of punched it up a bit more too so Everyone knows the green swizzle sticks, right? And I love yeah. how you strategically sure. strategically covered up Starbucks. We still know what it yeah. is, but well, <laughs> that's right. But actually, if you read it, it says sucks. Yeah, <laughs> it does. <laughs> Unintentional, but you're right. It does. You know, all, we get letters from people that point out these uh, things that they discover that they, uh, they think are hidden messages. So uh, it's important to deny them every so often, I guess. Here you've got the lady standing by the front door and she's afraid to go outside. She's all agoraphobic. It says pandemic anxiety meet post pandemic anxiety. And she's got thoughts in her head saying, wait, I forget. How do I function in society again? I haven't worn pants since March and all my shirts are now crop tops. How do I greet people? Hugs, elbows. And what do I say? I ran out of things to talk about around May. What are restaurants again? My diet has been cheese strings, pop tarts. The world was a scary place. I've erased all this from my memory now. You know, I don't remember the pandemic. The last two or three years are all sort of uh, wiped wiped off my uh, memory. So, but that's the thoughts that were going through my head at the time. Dave, Those, do you wear bunny slippers when you're? I, I do not. No. I do not. I should get some because I, I put them in a lot of cartoons. So I, I should uh, step it up a little here. Okay. So this is a New Year's cartoon. And again, editors love these uh, holiday cartoons. You've got uh, Old Man Time labeled 2020 and uh, Little Baby New Year 2021. Old Man Time with his scythe says, are you sure you want to go out there? You wouldn't believe the things I've seen in this past year. The little Baby 2021 says, Hey, what happens in 2020 stays in 2020. So that's a cartoon that could run every year. How, yeah. how tempted are you ever to just change the numbers and reissue it every couple of years? <laughs> Sometimes I actually end up doing a cartoon that I completely forgot I've already done. And then right. years later, I'll say, oh, I already did that like in 2015 or something. Now and then I'll reuse an image and alter it slightly and it'll be a whole new idea. But uh, I try not yeah. to do that. I just re redraw the thing. So. Yeah. Dave, what, what tools are you using to make your cartoons? Um, well, like you, I switched to digital. Um, I still do the actual drawing on paper, on pen and ink. I still prefer that. And then I scan it and my medium used to be watercolor. So I found a program that replicates watercolor pretty closely to what uh, you can achieve on tr traditional media. And I really like it. It's way faster. You don't have to mix all the paints and cut the board and everything. And um, when I do children's books and things like that, I find sometimes the editor will say, I don't like that blue background. And then you got to like, if you've done it in watercolor, you've got a big task ahead, but with digital, you can just take it out, put in new color, yeah. change the tone, you know, so it opens up a lot more, uh, like you said, it changed my life. Bit, so you can be a lot faster. Here we are at the gas station car. It's driving by and there's a huge snail moving very slowly toward the gas sign with what looks like a price rise for the gas prices. And the man in the car says, have you ever noticed that they are just a little bit slower to change the gas prices when oil goes down? 
So true, by the way. So true. Yeah. I hear Break everyone snail. commenting. Every every long weekend they make this the comment, right? That the gas goes shooting, then yeah. oil prices will crash the next week and they it's still the same price. Yeah, they gotta float that profit as long as they can. Mm hmm You got a Christmas cartoon. Santa has uh the little kid on his lap laptop rather than having the kid sitting on his lap. And she says all I want for Christmas is for things to be the way they used to be. And the elf is looking sad and sad is looking sad. And it's also sad. So here's an example where I did reuse this. The tree is remember. sad. Yeah, the yeah. tree. The tree. You don't want a saggy tree like that. I'm telling you. But this is where an example where I reused the cartoon from the year before where the little kid was sitting in Santa's lap. So I wanted to contrast the two. Now she's on, the, on a laptop because of uh, COVID. So. You mentioned you do a lot of children's book. Do you, is that mm -hmm. medium different than your editorial cartoons? Do you approach it the same way uh, in terms of the tools you use and the color and things like that? Or Pretty much like I've, uh, it used to be two completely separate styles, but now I, um, it's pretty close to what you see there. And sometimes I'll work back into it with other things like chalk or whatever, but uh, yeah, it's uh, pretty much the feel of it there. Here's your Memorial Day cartoon. The kid is saluting at the grave and the shadow of the kid in the grave forms the salute back to him from the bygone soldier. And the grave says, never forget. And this is just very sad and moving. And uh, just the attitude that we should have on Memorial Day. Drawing a Memorial Day cartoon is, is difficult because it's, it's referencing an historic event. And unless there's something relatively new that you can tie into it, it's challenging to come up with something mm -hmm. fresh and this is a yeah. fresh take on it and a poignant image and uh, just uh, really beautiful in the background. The background is beautiful too. Just hinted at the, the other grave markers and tree. It's just lovely. Oh, thank you, yeah. Jeff. Gee. Yeah. This is one, again, I, I wasn't sure about the idea, but I, I just, there's so many, um, it, it's hard to do something new. Um, so I, I didn't know if this was fresh and new or not, but it's just one of those things I thought, you know, I got it. I have to do this. So I went ahead and, uh, yeah, it, it represents a kind of cartoon that editors love because it, it celebrates patriotism and it's one, uh, universally that both left and right readers will appreciate. And there's no, mm -hmm. there's no, uh, uh, partisanship in it. And it's just a great, uh, and, and as well as the way it's executed with the, the long shadow is a great, I mean, it's instantly understandable and, uh, it's the kind of, it's the kind of cartoon people are going to clip out, put on the refrigerator and. Oh, I saw this is a wonderful cartoon. And so, yeah, that hits all the, hits all the marks for sure for editors. Thanks. Yeah. The, the shadow was tricky. I had to play around with that for quite a while. Um, when you do a silhouette, you have to minimize the information you're seeing. So if you filled that in with the face and rendered the, uh, the body, it would look quite different, but because it's yeah. a silhouette, you can cheat a little bit and, right. and get the point across. Yeah. It works well. Okay. Here you've got a four panel cartoon. And the man reading the newspaper, the woman's looking over his shoulder, the, the headlines change on the news panel from panel to panel. And, you know, if you're listening to this in audio only, you cannot fully appreciate how funny the wallpaper is and how funny her hair is, <laughs> and how funny her lips are. This is great. So the man is looking at the newspaper that says worldwide pandemic. And he says, well, it can't get any worse than this. And then in the next newspaper, January 6th riots attack on democracy and he says well it can't get any worse than this and the next panel they're getting older and the newspaper says russia invades ukraine and the man says well it can't get any worse than this and then in the next frame they're looking really old he's got no more hair and the newspaper says threat of nuclear war and the man says well it can't get any worse than this and the wife says stop saying that that's very funny. You know, the wife doesn't get older like the man does. Yeah, I, I, I was, uh, I think I just was trying to depict, like we've all aged so much with everything that's gone on in the last uh, two years or three years. But uh, that's a good point. I should have maybe had her hair turning whiter or something. I, Dave, I love how, I love the, the sort of the secondary punchline, if that's what you might call it. Stop saying that. If I had brought us 14, I don't know that I would have come up with that. I might've just said to be continued. I've done those kinds of cartoons where it's repeated then to be continued uh, into infinity. This is brilliant because uh, it's just sort of a little extra twist at the end that I didn't, I didn't see coming when I first 
read this uh, and it almost infers, yeah, it's, it's expressing her own frustration and infers somehow that maybe by him saying that he somehow, he has some kind of control or is impacting the world at large. And of course he's not, but uh, it's her way of expressing and gives her voice too, rather than just being a, a, uh, somebody standing in the background. So that, that just brought, I, that's why it's one of my favorites uh, out of this top 10 of yours. No, oh, thanks. You know, it's also true that these events were not that many years apart and the events no. are aging him. Mm -hmm, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's think what's January, funny about it too. January 6th and then the uh, Russia invading, like that's really a year apart, you know? So. Right. But yeah, this is almost based on my uh, home life because uh, sometimes I'll, being an editorial cartoonist, you're constantly on the latest, what's the latest news? And I'll so repeat it to my wife and she'll say, I'll say, well, you know, at least... It can't get any worse than what's happening now. And she'll, and it's almost the same thing. She's like, every time you say that, it gets worse. So, yeah. so uh, it's almost a little a slice of life there. So, and that's Dave, if you put out a cartoon, if you put out a cartoon collection soon, you should just call it. It can't get any worse than this. <laughs> yeah. I like it. Okay. So it's winter time and the gal is at the door coming out to see her Amazon package delivered on the front steps. She's wearing a Santa hat. And at the top, it says, when you drink wine and shop online, it's like you're your own secret Santa. And she says, oh, food. what did I get myself? This is uh, one of More those, bunny uh, slippers. Uh, More yeah, bunny know, slippers, Dave. Oh, oh, yes. What's up with the bunny slippers? I'll have to put them in every cartoon, I guess. Now, so. well, I mean, well, maybe they're don't... in the box. She's ordered more. Yeah. <laughs> holiday, sho holiday shopping cartoons, Black Friday cartoons. Those over the last decade have become increasingly popular with editors. They look at those as, as, as part of the holiday tradition. And so they want those along with Santa cartoons. And so this plays right into that for sure. And, and this is a sort of, again, a slice of life. My wife ordered some stuff online and it uh, wasn't that she, she was drinking wine at the time. I threw that in, but she kind of forgot what she ordered and the package showed up. And she's like, oh, I wonder what this is. It right, was like, right. you know, so I thought, hey, you know, as a cartoonist, you're always, you know, bing, there's the idea right there. Right. Yeah. So, so again, it's, it's funny. The, the ones that uh, that hit or are popular, it's, it's, they always surprise me sometimes when, like, I wouldn't have picked these as the top 10. But the idea of top 10 versus what the public says is always different. Uh, yeah, for sure. for sure. For sure. I get car it's about cartoonists about the, from cartoonists about what's in the, the top 10. Uh, yeah. A lot of them really don't like the top 10. Some of them, um, they draw very nice cartoons, but they don't ever show up in the top 10. And that's very frustrating for a lot of cartoonists. You know, we've got 60 car cartoonists, and there's only 10 in the top 10, and half of them are taken up by you two guys. Well, maybe those guys who are frustrated are drawing really great hard-hitting cartoons, and that's a reflection on that, because mm -hmm. I see the work of other people that aren't getting it, and they're doing fantastic work. Yeah, it's not their fault. Yeah. It's because editors, you know, with all due respect, uh, so that's no reflection. So, hey, guys, if you're doing those cartoons, I, much respect. So, well, it is, and, it is, uh, it is, for a guy like me who doesn't have a newspaper job anymore, uh, I, I'm supported on Patreon, but I rely on a syndication to help get me through. So, uh, I wish if I just had a newspaper platform and I could just draw hard hitting cartoons all the time, I, I probably would. Mm -hmm. It illustrates the great debate that's been going on for decades now of, of hard hitting versus the sort of tonight show stand up, you know, uh, rickshaw kind of cartoons. And, uh, Cartoonists want to be considered hard-hitting journalists and they want the Pulitzer Prize, but uh, those cartoons, the editors don't care about and the public doesn't care about. It. They want the cute cartoons and we've all done it. We've all gone some places and they, you know, to talk to classrooms or talk to people. And what do they ask us? Hey, can you draw Garfield? Can you draw mm -hmm. Snoopy? You know, they don't really care about what you, they just want you to do that because, you know, they look at that as what, what's popular. And so um, there's always that disconnect between what gets run and what's, what's, um, what we can say. And if you, if you draw Snoopy on the chalkboard before, be sure to write the apologies to yeah. show up. Yeah. Uh, on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and if, uh, if you want a cartoon, put a, put a bunny slippers in if you want. To go <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, here you've got the inside of an airplane and, uh, stewardess is yelling at the people into the airplane. Help. Is there anybody on board who knows how to fly a plane? <laughs> And the guy sitting in the front seat with his phone says, uh, but this plane hasn't even left the ground yet. And she says, I know because we have no pilot staff shortages. You know, you're illustrating the headlines here and, uh, that's just what newspapers like. 
one thing I have trouble is drawing the inside of a plane. So when I get an idea like this, it's like, oh man, you know, I, I find it hard to space the, the, the seat so you can see what's going on. Like technically this would be wrong because they'd have people where the uh, bottom bubble is, there'd be people covering her up, but you know, you have to kind of cheat a little bit, I guess. And well, it works for your are... style and it, and I don't think anybody would question that. It, it, you pulled it off wonderfully and it complements your style and it works. So oh, thanks. Very nice inside of a plane. Gentlemen, we are, we are at the end of our top 10 and each of your top 10s. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you to Jeff Katurba, the brilliant cartoonist from Nebraska. And thank you to uh, Dave Wamond, the brilliant cartoonist from Calgary, Canada. Thank Thanks, you guys. to my uh, brilliant executive editor, Brian Farrington from Phoenix, Arizona, and from me in Los Angeles. Thank you, everybody. Uh, that's it. Remember to subscribe and remember to visit kegel.com to see all the cartoons, visit kegelcast.com to see all of our history of podcasts, which is growing every week. We will see you next time with our next episode, which will be about artificial intelligence cartoons and our brilliant cartoonist, uh, Rick McKee. So thank you and goodbye, gentlemen. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you.